Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming out today. Um, welcome, welcome. I am Liza Bernard. I'm in charge of programming here at the Norman Williams Public Library. For those of you who are new to the library, the building was built back in 1883, and we still have a full calendar of events and programs going on. Um, we are delighted to work with the Yankee Bookshop today uh, to bring you this yummy presentation. And the book table is in the back if you just arrived and missed it, and there are treats on the side table there that um, I was told if they don't leave with the audience, I will have to eat them all. That's not <laughs> good the uh, format for today is gonna be really straightforward. Oh, first of all, rem um, a reminder to turn off your cell phone ringers. Um, uh, format, straightforward. Carrie from the Yankee Bookshop will give a brief intro of our wonderful guests, and then they'll have a floor, and there should be time for question and answer. And then Gazine is happy to sign books, and um, I just want to quick mention that we're very grateful that uh, WCTV is here to film for those people who weren't able to fit into our space. So without further ado, Carrie, it's yours. Thank you, Liza. And thank you to all of you for joining us today. I'm terrible at microphones, so can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great, wonderful, all right. Mm -hmm. Um, I just want to let you know we do have we still have some copies of the book in the back those are all signed already so if you need to get out of here at a specific time you can grab one of those on your way out um, and also what else do I want to let you know we also have Gazina's memoir um, and one of her previous cookbooks as well back there um, in case you're interested and let's see what else did I need to share this is new. I haven't done one of these in more than three years at this point. <laughs> Thank you so much for all coming. What a weird three years it's been, right? Um, okay. So, and we want to let everyone know that a portion of today's proceeds do go to the library as a thank you for letting us be here in their wonderful space because we could not fit all of you in our cozy bookshop across the street. <laughs> all right. So today I have the pleasure of introducing you to two very fine Vermont transplants. Um, our interviewer for today, Mary King, is a writer and all-around food enthusiast and a good friend of our bookshop. Her past experience working at some of the nation's most celebrated restaurants and her passion for cooking for and sharing great food with others made her an obvious choice to help out with this event. The book we're here to celebrate is just beautiful. If you've gotten a copy, you already know. Um, <laughs> And I can personally vouch for at least four of the recipes in the book. <laughs> Christian and I have, had, have been eating very well for the last two weeks, right? <laughs> um, so I hope you'll have a chance to try. That's the maple bundt cake from the book that many of you are already holding. Um, let's see. So a bit about this book. Uh, when Gazina Bullock Prado left her Hollywood life in 2004 and moved to Vermont, she fell in love with the Green Mountain State's flavors and six unique seasons. Spring, summer, fall, and winter all claim their place at this table, but a true Vermonter holds extra space for the maple forward mud season, that time of year when spring thawing ice makes way for mucky roads very soon, right? <laughs> and stick season, a notable period of bare trees and gourds galore prior to winter. In My Vermont Table, Bullock Prado takes readers on a sweet and savory journey through each of these special seasons with more than 100 recipes and stories, and the stories are great. They're really fun. Um, Gazina Bullock Prado is a renowned based pastry chef, cookbook author, baking instructor, and television personality. She is the author of five well-received baking books and a baking memoir. Her confections have been featured in publications from Better Homes and Gardens to People Magazine, and she's a regular food presenter on the Today Show. She is the owner and baking instructor at Sugar Glider Kitchen in Hartford, Vermont. So please join me in welcoming Gazina Bullock Prado. Thank you all for coming. This is just such a delight. Well, and thank you for writing such a beautiful book. I know I've seen people paging through it already um, and giving us all a reason to gather together on this uh, kind of gray end of winter, pre-mud season day. Pre-mud season, yeah. <laughs> um, In your book, you weave together not only these amazing, delicious recipes, but so much great memoir 
and a lot of history, actually, in the recipes and the history of the area. So I kind of wanted to explore those themes with you. Let's do it. Okay. And in your intro, you quote uh, Simple Gifts. So I would like to quote one of my favorite songs. Um, let's start at the very beginning. Um, <laughs> with the, the uh, title, My Vermont Table. I know a lot of people are going to resonate with the Vermont in the title, mm -hmm. but the word that I find the most interesting is the my. Can you talk a little bit about the my-ness of it and how your Vermont table might differ from any of our Vermont tables? Well, I think, as we all know, no matter where you go, there you are. <laughs> so, I, I can't, um, the fact that I had a German mother and I had, we call him Albamonian, and a father from Alabama, uh, <laughs> definitely plays a big part in my culinary tradition. Um, the fact that I grew up sweets obsessed, and a matter of fact, my childhood friend Stacy's here. Uh, from, so I grew up in Virginia, and my mother raised us vegetarian vegan, and I was so angry at lunchtime. <laughs> I was so angry at lunchtime. Veganism in the 80s is a completely different thing from what it is today. And um, so I grew up sugar obsessed. The Coleman's, Stacy's house, was a respite because her mom stocked all the good stuff. <laughs> Oreos, you name it, had it. <clears throat> uh, and then so <clears throat> I fought against everything healthy for so long. I didn't like real cheese until I was 12. I thought the orange stuff was so much better. <laughs> Just because I couldn't have it. I couldn't have cheese in general. But when I started to explore real food, uh, I found, and that wasn't macrobiotic, mm. uh, I became obsessed with food as a whole. And having a German background, um, I'm very cabbage forward. Uh, <laughs> cruciferous vegetables are my be all end all. Um, but then coming here, the fact that the second my husband, Ray, who took the pictures, he did all the pictures. Um, he went to Dartmouth, bless his heart, and um, he, we drove across the bridge into Norwich, and my heart just opened. I'm like, this is home. The Upper Valley specifically, I find just so delightful. And um, we were living in LA at the time, and it always stayed in the back of my mind. There is a place. When you're ready, there is a place, and this is the place. And the food is so fantastic. And the fact that we do have those six seasons and we can look forward to something, <laughs> which is what we all tend to do. We're all talking right now about what are you planting? What is growing? Um, it, it makes food so much more eventful because it is so of the season. And my friend Becky's here, who is my foraging partner. And she's the one who discovered, to her great delight, and a little dismay and jealousy. Uh, we were, I think, making pizza in our wood oven, and she found a morel just sitting by my chicken coop, like just, just there. It was like it had no business being there. <laughs> and she was just like, oh my goodness, and how dare you? <laughs> it was just there. And as it happens, the spring ephemerals just love our little, our little, I will not tell you where, our little nook. And it's just this place just opened up my mind and my heart to all these delicious things that I couldn't have imagined loving when I was a child. I would have looked at this book as a child and go, this looks fantastic, except for the green stuff. And <laughs> was there sort of a gateway Vermont ingredient for you that was sort of your first discovery of the, the food ways here? Well, I mean, I well, cheese, 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 and more cheese, <coughs> and um, beer, and more beer. And then th there's just all, all the things that kind of live in me anyway. I am a very dairy-forward human, and a full-fat dairy-forward human. So it just, it was like, this all makes sense to me. I get so upset when I go to New York where you cannot buy mm. a whole-fat anything in the grocery <laughs> store. And I long to be back here where I can get all that butter fat back in my life. I'm like, I'm feeling my, I'm like, oh, I have to fill back up. Um, that I think is one of the things that speaks to me the most. I'm very dairy forward. Uh, bread, there you go. And, <laughs> and coming and from LA, bread. I, I, I felt like I was in the, that's why my, my first memoir was called Confections of a Closet Master Baker because 
doing anything with gluten, God forbid, in Los Angeles was just not done. And so I was making bread, laminating dough, you name it. And I, poor husband Ray was just having to eat all, everything, because you can't take it out of your house. You would be shunned. <laughs> true, very true. Um, um, when you were starting with this book, was there, what was the first recipe you really attacked? Let me think. Um, I'm trying to think what season we started in. Well, first, when I, when I started writing this book, it differed from all my other books, obviously, in that all my other books are pastry. It's pastry, pasty, pastry, baking, baking, baking. Uh, and some savory, but mostly sweet. Um, and I was asked to write this book. Uh, my students had requested this book. And then the publisher asked me to write this book. And I had been like, in my heart, this is the book I had been wanting to write. Um, and I'm, I want to say the goulash was the first thing. And only because it's something that I make all the time anyway. Mm. Uh, and, you know, the German, the Spätzle that goes with it. I sometimes, I made dumplings yesterday to go with it. Uh, so that, and that would have been closer to winter. And having all those lovely spices, adding a little maple, adding kind of this um, symphony of flavor, just layering and layering and layering. Um, and realizing that no one can stop me from making my own goulash. Mm. So that's why I call it goulash-ish. <laughs> because I, I refuse to stick to what I was so German. No, you cannot do that. You must stick to the recipe. I'm like, I don't have to. I'm a grown woman. I was actually going to ask you, but you have a lot of family-inspired uh, recipes, recipes clearly that came from mm -hmm. your mother and your aunt. Um, and I was going to ask you, actually, if you are ever a little bit precious about uh, revising or testing those recipes, but clearly, no. <laughs> no. I, I, am, I am precious only in the memory of them. Mm. Uh, the things that are precious are my mother's potato salad. Which is uh, in the book. It was in the book. And the sister's gravy, which is when my mother, my mother and her sister made this gravy. Both of those are improvisational dances, though. Mm. And so the preciousness is in what goes into them. How you layer those things is totally up to you. And they're both conversations more than recipes, which I love. So the sister's gravy was always coming out on Thanksgiving. And my Tante Erika, her sister, both transplants from Germany, um, had never really made Thanksgiving until they moved to the States. And my mother's first turkey, she, would, my, she did it in the South. I, my poor mother. She's in the South, and she says, of course I can make a turkey. How hard could it be? And um, <laughs> so she makes the turkey, and my Aunt Ludy says, um, so did you make stuffing? And, and my mom says, well, it already came stuffed. <laughs> and then you know what happened. Ah, yeah. It did already come <laughs> stuffed. It wasn't supposed to taste stuffed. My mother never again made a stuffing again, or a dressing, neither. She was like, N none of it, but what she did excel in is the turkey itself and the gravy. And it was a song and dance between the two sisters, and it was a very quiet conversation because one of the main ingredients is sour cream. And my uncle Ron hates sour cream, but he loved the gravy. So what are you going to do? So it was this, they were conspiring in the kitchen all the time, talking about get the muggy, get this, get that, get the other, and then just add, and then tasting, tasting, tasting. Uh, and so it was this conspiratory, and it was never written down because it could be found as evidence of sour, <laughs> of sour cream. So the sour cream evidence was never to be like shared ever. And so, when, so my sister and I, whether we're together or apart, there is this weeks long conversation of, do you have the horseradish? Do you have the muggy? Do you have the capers? And then on the day of, the conversation of, what is it missing? What is it missing? What do we have to add? And it's this constant dance and conversation. So all the ingredients remain the same, and the conversation, but it's the conversation that matters and how you just layer everything together. And the potato salad is very, very similar in that it has just the same elements every time. I have changed the mayonnaise, though. I have changed the mayonnaise. My mother always Big used nose. Hellman's. I used Duke's. <laughs> Dukes is good. 
Dudes is good, and you can only get it in the South. I have it. I have it imported. That's what <laughs> it is. Good. Mm. So yeah. So, uh, but I think had Helga ever had Dukes, she would agree with me. See, that's the thing. I, I, and that's the other thing about this book. I, I miss God. Like, oh, I wish I could share this with Helga. She would have loved it, mm. and she would have loved Dukes. Yeah. yeah, guaranteed. You have a lot of little um, secret ingredients sort of woven throughout a lot of these recipes, mm -hmm. and in fact, you're sort of um, holy trinity of seasonings, salt, maple, and um, vinegar mm -hmm. is sort of your go-to. But you also have an ingredient that I found really fascinating, starch water. Yeah. How did you hit upon the magic of starch water, and what do people say when they see it sitting on your counter? <laughs> well, I think it is, I think for bakers, it is a no-brainer because starch, well, the, I'm sure you all know milk dough, milk bread. Um, and it is a very starch forward uh, bread where you gelatinize the flour. Now I'm getting technical, sorry. <laughs> You're in a class now. You're gelatinizing the starches by heating together flour, milk, and water. And what that does is it creates a very bouncy bread, a very spongy bread. The, the bread of my childhood fantasies that I never got, uh, except for at Stacy's house. Thank you, Stacy. Um, <laughs> So starch water does that very quickly, not as heavily, but starch water because it is the water that's left over from cooking pasta or potatoes. And so because it's so starch rich, if you have a recipe, a bread recipe that calls for water and you have remembered to harvest, <laughs> that's the thing that happens is that it's going through the colander and that's the bloody scream. It's like, no. <laughs> so I have this wet jar that just by the sink sometimes, but when it's not, and as you're pouring it in, it's slow motion. Ah, it's going down the drain. So if you remember to keep it, and you like that kind of very soft, spongy texture, uh, then you save the starch water, and you use it instead of the water that's called for in the recipe. Also, adding a small amount into an omelet gives it a creamier texture. Mm -hmm. And just a little, just like a tablespoon or so, is glorious. So it's just about remembering to do it. And then once you capture it, you refrigerate it. I love that tip about the omelet because it's one of those things, no one's ever gonna taste it. They're just gonna think you're a genius. They're gonna know it. Yeah. They're going to know it in their hearts. They're gonna think, I can never make an omelet like this. <laughs> yeah. I have to get Cathina to make yeah. it for me. Do you have any um, secret ingredients or any secret recipes, things that are very personal to you or, or that you've, you've really cracked personally that you feel like, I might never share this. One. <laughs> and I've never written it down. And it was the one that got me started in business. Uh -huh. It was the Montpelier maple macaron or macaroon. Yeah. Ooh. I mean, that's a good, you got to keep that close to your vest. I'm, I, I wonder if I still remember it because I've never written it down. But yes, when I developed that one, and I developed in, in tandem three recipes, that one, which is a riff off the, uh, the it is the original macaron. So it was the more rustic version. Then the Starry Starry Nights, which are also gluten-free, but they're a chocolate truffly version of that. And then uh, the Big Winooski. So I've published the recipes for Starry Starry Nights and the Big Winooski. The other shall never see the light of day. I gotta love that. I actually really love that. <laughs> you have to have your secrets, right? But there's only the one. There's only the one. And that, that is like, that's the one. Everything else, I'm like, I will tell you everything. I'm like, I'm not one of those people that holds something back from a recipe. I'm like, if I give it to you, not only will I give you everything in the recipe, I will like give you minute instructions about how to do it and why you're doing it. That's the other thing. Mm. I'll give you, I'll tell you everything in it and the why, because I think that is even more helpful because sometimes you're like, why does it have to be room temperature? Well, I'll tell you why. And then now you'll go, oh, Oh, of course. That's sort of the instructor forget. in you. Yeah. You, have you always sort of had that instructor um, like leaning towards that style of, of cooking and, and sharing your recipes with people even when you were running your bakery? I think uh, just as a human, that is my go-to. That when I was a kid reading Encyclopedia Brown, I knew I wanted to go to law school and I wanted to be a lawyer. Uh, but then I should have known based on my history of uh, someone had asked me the other day, like, was it your grandmother or your mother that inspired you to be in the kitchen? And I'm <laughs> like, no, nah, not really. My grandmother kind of. You know who really inspired me? Was the witch in Hansel and Gretel. 
And it, I wasn't, see this is, I wasn't getting the nuance of children being cooked and eaten. That wasn't it. My thing was the house. Do you remember the house? Absolutely. It was made of treats. <laughs> and when I was a kid, I'm like, shush, 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 children in baked oven, whatever. I'm like, can we just focus on the house? Okay, that was a digression. <laughs> anyway, so I should have known as a child that baking should have been the thing, but I wanted to be a lawyer, and it turns out that my great <coughs> talent, as my husband always calls me, moot court queen, I'm really good at, in moot court. I'm really good at just talking patter, argument, making cases, even if I'm on the wrong side of everything. <laughs> if I have like, if I have this argument, I mean, I, it's a very dangerous thing. So thank goodness I'm not a lawyer because I could be very dangerous. Um, but that kind of, but, but explaining things to me is a great joy, but explaining the thing I love so much and wanting people, especially people who are like, a lot of people say I'm, I'm a bad baker, I'm not good at baking. I'm like, there is no such thing. There's just not having been told the why mm. and how. And some people have hot hands, and you're like, you're wondering why your pie dough is always like, bleh. Well, it's like, that's what the first thing I ask. Let me feel your hands. Well, we will rectify this. Not giving you new hands, but <laughs> the way you make the dough will change based on the you of you. That's awesome. I love yeah. that. Checking the hands. Yeah, checking the hands. <laughs> I have very bad circulation, hence great baker's hands. Is there, is there a recipe in the book that you would recommend that people who call themselves bad bakers start with? Well, not the inverse puff. <laughs> on the other hand, hmm, on the other hand, uh, no, and I'll tell you why, because I think any, anyone can make any recipe. You just have to not be scared to breathe and have patience. So those are the first things. Um, and then, um, so, I mentioned inverse puff because it is an insane thing when on paper. Does anyone know what inverse puff is? Or remember say, so puff pastry, if you know what it is, it's a lot of butter. But traditionally what you do, you have a butter block, a literal block of butter, and then it is encased in dough, and then you laminate it. And by that you roll it out and you fold, you roll and fold, so you get all these layers, boop, 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 boop. So it goes in the oven and it goes, wah, jazz hands. So dough on the outside, that's what you gotta remember. Inverse puff, the butter's on the outside. So you essentially make a paste of butter. And then Sounds you- Sounds great, and then I'm you, already there. Then you roll it, so, and then you think that and you're like, none of this is gonna turn out well at all, right? Because there's butter on the outside. And if you've watched Great British Bake Off, it went very badly for one person. It was a very, <laughs> it was a very hot tent. Um, I had a puff class recently, and I had decided, I used to just have the students do quick puff hands-on, and then I would show to, how to do the lamination. And I was like, no, you know what? I'm gonna just have them do the inverse. It's more fun. And I had these two sisters who were doing, from Iowa, who came to take classes uh, as a sister's weekend. One was a baker, the other was a farmer. The other one did not bake at all. And she was like, this is the only class we could get into and I'm screwed. And I looked at her, I looked at her, I'm like, you can f like birth a foal, you can make inverse, no problem. <laughs> she walked out with perfection, perfection. Because it's like, if you walk in thinking this is not for me or I cannot certainly do this, then you are asking yourself to not explore and learn something new. But if you go into it thinking this could be fun, and if I do screw up, I might learn something. That's the way in. And so start with anything you want. Yeah, the mistakes are a part of it. Absolutely. It's a sign you're doing it right. Yeah. If you're messing it up. Yeah. <laughs> you will learn something. I love what you said earlier about your recipes being a conversation. Um, and that kind of leads me into all of your recipes have these really excellent head notes. And some of them really verge into memoir. Mm -hmm. And there's this one uh, essay sort of moment in the book early on where you talk about your goose mama oh. that just, I found so moving. Oh, um, I love her. Can you like tell everyone a little bit about mama and how she's doing now? Well, mama is currently cooped up because a coyote was seen in the neighborhood. So she's getting breakfast in bed. Um, <laughs> but mama came about from Irene. And when Irene blew through, there it was a local farm that um, was in great trouble. 
And so uh, we are such great people, Vermonters. We, uh, everybody immediately went and helped. Uh, and so their chickens were up, literally they said, if you can grab a chicken, you can have a chicken because everything was decimated. But their waterfowl, they wanted to keep, but they weren't able to keep them at the time. So I volunteered to foster them. So it was like maybe 24 Indian runner ducks, geese, you name it. So I took them in and I fell in love uh, to my husband's chagrin. And then so I decided like just prior to them being picked up again, I'm going to uh, hatch them out. And so I asked some friends who are also bird keepers and I said, does anybody want a goose or two? And I had a few takers. As they were all hatching, and I did the Google calculation of like how many should I incubate in order to get a set number. They all hatched. <laughs> and everyone who had said, yay, I want some, said, no, we can't take them. So I had like 48 all together, oh including the fosters, <laughs> birds. And it was fantastic when they're like fluffy and snuggly and all fantastic, but then they hit puberty and it's Game of Thrones and it's ugly. <laughs> and so if you've ever seen a flock of birds like mm, in close proximity, it is not fun. And so it was during this time where I started to bond with one, a white goose in Emden, and she was broody. And if you know domestic birds, it's, it's kind of rare for them to be broody, but she was like broody day one. And she was sitting on her eggs, and when you get broody, you get your little stoned, because the whole point is that you want to stay on the eggs. Like it's kind of this, you're in this lovely meditation of like hatching, hatching, hatching. And so I opened up the coop one day, and I looked at mama, and mama's white, but there was red all over her. And she had been beaten up, and I'm like, not on my watch. So birds have natural pods, and I put them into pods after I yelled at them. And I went to the 4-H groups and to the farmer groups, and I said, I like if anyone wants to adopt these guys, th these are the pods, I'm saving mama. So mama healed, but mama still wanted to be a mama. And by that time, all the eggs had gone bad, but she was still rolling them into her nest. And then when I would take them away, she would roll rocks into her nest. And she would stay broody for as long as she had a clutch of eggs, she would stay broody. So I researched, I said, I'm not getting her any goose friends because they're too similar in size and they're gonna be mean. So I researched and I found a duck that was, and I'm not kidding, it's called the stoner duck of ducks. <laughs> I wanted something that was just really mellow and only females, no offense intended, but the drakes are jerks. So I got baby Welsh Harlequin ducks and I got chicks and when they came, um, I said, I, didn't, I wasn't quite sure. I'm like, she's only sat on eggs. She's never had a chick. So I brought them into this room that like abuts to the outside and I opened the door and I had them in a little pen and you cheep, cheep, cheep. She started to, sh she was shivering. Goosebumps on a goose, shaking. And she stuck her head in, she goes, she murmurs. And I was like, she was in love. So since then, she and I have raised, uh, what, I think eight chicks together. Mm. Uh, and she's such a good mama. And um, so I start the beginning part, and sh we visit all together, and then we kind of figure out, we have conversations. I'm a little lunatic. <laughs> and so, and then we decide when they're ready to go with her, and then we take them into her pen, and that's it. Mama's fantastic. And she sometimes gets sick of taking care of the kids. <laughs> um, so she'll just join me, and she'll garden with me and stuff. And when I, once, <laughs> once I was growing pumpkins up a trellis, about it and they were just starting to go and it was like the, per the perfect thing you can imagine an archway the pumpkins were actually doing what I asked them to do they were actually growing and I'd managed to like harness them so they would just kind of they were, it's just beautiful and then we had decided to get a cleanup by an outside contractor and I came home and I saw all the leaves were like this and they had sliced through and I sat down on the ground and I wept. Just so silly. Mama crawled into my lap and put her little head here and I was like, oh my goodness. Okay, that's worth it. I should kill more things and get mama attention. Get some goose snuggles. You like goose snuggles. Mama's the best. Oh yeah. my gosh, she sounds like the best. She is. I can see why I love this story. Yeah. It's in, it's in the book. <laughs> it's in the book. Um, it sounds like the place where you live is just magical. You have mushrooms sprouting out of the ground and 
and geese all of the eggs hatch and well, I, like with every, the house was built in the 1700s, so there's, there are plenty of things that can go very wrong. Uh, but yeah, but the property itself, I feel, is incredibly magical. The people who built it, the Levitts, Free Grace and Jerusha Levitt, we have their portraits in the house. Uh, my husband found them. Um, they, I think, were hysterical people. <laughs> Not hysterical as in, like, as in, like, I think they had great senses of humor. I mean, they ran a tavern in Vermont. They must have had great senses of humor. Um, and he was also the clerk of the town. And he was also, he just did so much stuff. So we have this house that I think already has so much goodwill in it. Like during the War of 1812, when there was an embargo on British liquor, he just started making potato whiskey, which I don't know about you, that's vodka, right? <laughs> <laughs> but they called it whiskey, and they were growing potatoes, so I'm like, that's pretty fantastic. Uh, and so I just think that there's just a very a lovely vibe to the place, and our barn is beautiful, and, and which is the more important part of the property in Vermont. I mean, the house could like fall down as long as the barn's okay. <laughs> everything's okay. Um, and then our little baby animals are just make everything happen. And then those mushrooms. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's amazing. I love that when you were talking about the history of your house, there's a lot of history in several of the recipes in the mm -hmm. book. Um, Marlboro pie, and um, there's a corned beef recipe that's yeah. much older. Where do, you, where do you find these historical recipes, and what makes them stand out to you and, and get a hook in you, like, I have to develop my own version of this? Well, at first, you know, a lot of research, but also being friends with the people at like Calvin Coolidge at the historic site. Mm. I have, they have been my friends since I think day one of living in Vermont and kind of going through those wonderful recipes of, of, of women who uh, fed a lot of people and uh, had to do it with very little and with six seasons. <laughs> um, and so, for instance, one of the saltpeter is used in, in some of the rest, so if you want, you know, if you've got buckshot, maybe you can make some <laughs> corned beef. Um, but there are some, some recipes that I call brave little recipes because they are like that, where you have to get some pretty extraordinary ingredients to make them. Or there is something called salt rising bread, which is uh, a bread of the Appalachian Mountains. So you could find this being made it from Vermont down south. I mean, it was a bread that was made because yeast wasn't available. And so these incredibly industrious women found out how to make a leavening agent from what they had. And that would have been cornmeal. And you would keep it over the rock salt, which was warm all the time, not hot, not cold. It was warm. And it created this leavening agent that you should not, should not taste until it's baked. Because it is the same thing, the bacteria, that will get you sick on a cruise ship. Just saying. But the trick is now, it's harder to do now than it was then because we don't have that rock salt just being warm all the time. And you need it to be consistently warm to create that leavening agent so it sparks up overnight and then you feed it again, it sparks up twice. So that's pretty much 48 hours of something warm. And I thought, I know how to do this without a hitch. I know how to do this because I've got modern technology. And I can use an, um, I can use a sous vide, because if you know what a sous vide is, it keeps a constant temperature, and you can keep it at a l just low enough that this stuff thrives. And I'm like, it will be a guarantee. It was a guarantee. I was like, I have never failed. The other thing is that you need a cornmeal that is organic and that has the bacteria that will allow it to thrive. So if you've ever made a starter you know that it's always great to start with things that have the bacteria that allow for all of that yumminess to grow. So you need great water, you need good flour, King Arthur, um, for those things to actually be vibrant. And that is true of this bread. And then it stinks to high heaven, that starter. It is terrible. But when it bakes up, it is delicious and fabulous and so distinct, so distinct. Just the fact that when it works, even if you don't eat it, it's a miracle. It's one of those just things like, look what I just did. Yeah. Isn't that beautiful? I was going to ask you, actually, when you were talking about the historical recipes, I was going to sous vide myself. I was like, OK, and how do you work in the modern, the modern technology? Yes. You are a fan of sous vide. You use it in the uh, Beef Wellington recipe mm -hmm. in the book. Um, are there any other 
contemporary, modern uh, appliances that you think are must-haves in a home kitchen? I mean, there are some things, I mean, sous vide is number one. An air fryer, I mean, I can take it, I can leave it. Because I, I, know, I know how to do that in the oven. Um, but I think it's an interesting thing to have, and if you like it, then I, I, I say play with it all the time. Uh, there are some small wares that I think are fantastic, like perforated sheet pans and perforated mats. And a lot of people don't know them because they're usually only in professional kitchens, but you can get them in half sheet size and they're not that expensive and they store away. That's, I think, I think the number one thing is that they are useful and you can put them away without taking up a lot of space. Um, and what they do is they're helpful. I use that with the Beef Wellington, the perforated mat and the sheet pan because it allows the heat to hit the bottom of the puff at the same time as the top. So no soggy bottoms. Um, also great if you're making cookies. So if you've ever rolled out a cookie and you want to ice it and it was flat when it went to the oven and then it has that bow, it's because there's air trapped underneath and that perforated mat and sheet pan will just expel the air. So it's not you. It is, it, it's, the, it's the sheet pan. There's little things like that that I think are so useful and they're not, they're not expensive and they don't take up a lot of room. And, they, and you'll find reasons to use them in a myriad different things. Like the large cake spatula, I use it all the time. And for things not cake at all. Like what would you use it for? The to move a beef wellington. To move yeah. anything large that if you do not support it all the way around will in some way crack the beauty of the thing. Mm -hmm. And it's like, of course, you've taken a picture of when it comes out of the oven because who's not doing that now? <laughs> but still, when you present it at table, you want it to look as it did when it came out of the oven. And a cake spatula is one of those things that will help you. I use it to put lattice on top of pies. Mm. So I build a lattice and then I cool it. Cake spatula goes underneath and you put it. That's how we do it in class. And it's like, it's like this miracle has just befallen us. And I'm like, get a cake spatula, just build it off piste and you're... You're, you're great. I think that's one of those things that so many of us as home cooks never think about, that it's like, oh, we, we think it's so impossible to make our, our bakes look as perfect as a professional pastry chef. And it's like, no, there's little tips and tricks. And there are things. There are things that will help you. Also, patience. Uh, also, putting things back in the refrigerator if they're feeling, a lot of people start to panic mid, mid like, say, lattice. And they're like, ah! And they go faster with their hot little hands. <laughs> instead of putting it on a sheet pan and putting it into the refrigerator and say, I'm going to give myself a nice cup of coffee or wine uh, and just let it come to temperature. And not, but I think what happens is the panic creeps in. You think, I'm, I must finish, as opposed to, I don't have to. I can make this better if I just treat myself better. <laughs> One of the things I really love, that, like that's such an elegant solution, lattice off and then put it on top. One of the other things that struck me in the book, your blind baking technique. I've been baking at home for years and I worked in restaurants for a long time and I'd never seen anyone blind bake a crust the way you describe in this book. Upside down? Upside down. Upside down. It's, I mean, it's genius and it's so simple. Well, and it is like a, oh yeah, that would work, wouldn't it? I, I think mean, you just did my face when I read it. Yeah, like <laughs> it, it is. It's one of those things that, first of all, I recommend when you bake pies to use the flimsiest pie plate you can find so that the heat actually gets to the bottom crust and doesn't just melt it. Uh, and then if you are blind baking, you know what happens. It slumps. And it slumps usually because you're using a very heavy baking vessel. And then you've also weighed it down. So all the heat your, your lying oven is at 350. It's probably at 325 because it's lying to you. <laughs> so your lying oven, first of all, the heat is around it, but then it takes a, a while for the heat to get through that ceramic and through the weights. So by the time it gets there, it's like a lukewarm bathtub and it's just melting the dough. So the solution. The solution to me is to use the flimsiest pie plates. So you line your pie plate. You let the dough relax in the refrigerator, and you relax too. Then you put a second pie plate on top and you flip it over. And then you put that on a, on a um, parchment lined sheet pan because we all know what happens if you don't. <laughs> and then gravity will keep the pie dough where you just put it. 
And then the other pan underneath, it's going all the way up, right? So it's like holding all of it. It's like Spanx. It's holding it all there. <laughs> but that stuff is so flimsy that the heat is getting through. And then if you're using the light stuff, when you take it out of the oven to do the final bake when you release it, it's, it's light enough that you can use that cake spatula <laughs> to put it under, flip it back over, take up the top pan, and then continue the bake. And it's, it's mind-blowing, first of all. You feel like you are David Copperfield. You're like, ha-ha. <laughs> you know, the, the whole tablecloth out from underneath the table setting. It's a, it's a great trick. And those pie plates are usually just the right size to put into your farmhouse pottery. Beautiful <laughs> ceramic thing to display, right? So that, to me, is display. Here you go. Also, if you just take that pie itself to someone's house, you do not care if you leave that tin there. Fair. Yeah. I love that you worked the cake spatula in again. Yeah. Like, I love a good... I, you, love good I use it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's so much in the book, I could ask you a million more questions, but I think we should, we should open it up, see if uh, anyone in the audience has something they'd like to, to ask. I have a yeah. Just yeah. You refrigerate it. Uh, a week or two, um, so just give it a sniff. Give it a sniff. <laughs> it can go sour, so a week, yeah. There are a lot of things that I say, oh, until you find it again in the freezer, but that's something that you freeze, but so this is, a, the, the starch can go off. Okay. Great. Yeah, welcome. Yeah. So your stone pie pan you talked about? Yes. Grocery store. You can also buy very thin metal pans that are not aluminum that have perforations on the bottom that work really well as, as well. You just have to, if you want to do it upside down, you got to get two of the same pan. Yeah. I saw a hand back here. Yeah. That's that would be my husband who took the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite recipe in the book, Raymond? <laughs> You're behind the scenes. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> the Wellington, I think. The Wellington is a, is a big yes. They've all had the Wellington. Yeah. Is there a recipe that you're most looking forward to with maple season? All of them. I, but quite frankly, when we make maple syrup at home, it's just tasting it when it just comes to temperature. And every year we say the same thing. We're like, is it just us or is our maple syrup the best maple syrup? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, they're just, they're, ours is just more buttery than others. And, we, and so it's just tasting that first drop. And it's just that you go through all that rigmarole. It's like, why is it taking so long? And you're like, never again, until, until it comes to temperature. And you're like, this is why we do it. This is why we do it, because the stuff is just amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be German and go, because I said so? No. <laughs> so in some, in some recipes, very traditionally, you would use an egg yolk. And what it does is it provides a moisture and a binding agent, but also just a general, just gorgeous mouthfeel that a raw egg will not give you. And it only uses the yolk. Being both now a transplant Yankee and a German, I'm like, why am I going to waste the white? What would happen? So what I did is like, I'm just going to do the whole thing and see what happens. And it was fantastic. It's a tenderizer in there. And so there's a tradition in European baking of using cooked egg, cooked uh, cake, and bread within the texture of it. And what, it's an absorbing mechanism, but it's also a tenderizer. And that's what it does. Um, instead of imparting excess moisture. Because a shortcake, right, needs to be short, which means it has to be fat forward and it has to break up easily. So excess moisture is going to make it more cakey. 
So if you cook the egg, you've obviously evaporated the moisture from it, but you still have that protein power and the fat and that quotient that will give it that wonderful mouthfeel. So I've just kept the, the white in there because I was being um, cranky about the fact that I'm like, well, what's going to happen? And if it didn't work, I wouldn't have it in there, but it's fantastic. What's your favorite butter? Vermont Creamery is, it depends on what I'm baking. Vermont Creamery, unsalted, uh, is just glorious. If you're going to make the inverse, pie, that. Otherwise, uh, what I call American butter. A lower butter fat is great when you're doing so that just cabot, unsalted, not their high fat for anything else because oftentimes you can break the um, emulsion of something if there's too much fat. And if you're looking at very traditional American recipes, you don't want to say, oh, you know, more fat is better, which it usually is, but it could break the emulsion of the recipe because the recipe maker is using the lower fat butter. So unless indicated, I would use Cabot unsalted and then otherwise Vermont Creamery. Do you yes. Always use, butter? always use unsalted. Always. I will know if you do not. <laughs> uh, so you, in baking, you always use unsalted because you want to control, if you notice control is a theme going throughout this. You want to control the amount of salt you have in the recipe, and each manufacturer puts a different amount of salt in there. And salt was originally used to just preserve the butter, right? It's a preservative. And I find that people who have salted butter in the refrigerator are not bakers. And what happens is that that butter has usually been having a very, very luxurious life in the refrigerator, not being used at all. So it goes rancid. I call it butter funk. And then that person decides to bake on one gloomy day and then writes me and says, why does my cake taste like cheese? And I say, then why did you use salted butter? And they think that I'm some kind of genie who was like, <laughs> how do you know? And I'm like, because I know. I will always know. Well, Vermont gives you no choice. <laughs> yeah, there, there, well, some of it is there is no choice. So with, with spring ephemerals, you got no choice. They're there for a week, that's where the recipes go. So fiddleheads, ramps, morels, that's where they are. Maple, obvious for mud season. And for the rest of them, it's, by, it, it's just by what was available. And I'm, on our property, we have a peach tree. And I'm like, can we be realistic? Because if I'm writing this for Vermonters, it's not summer, this is fall. My stone fruit's coming in the fall. And I'm like, so that's when this recipe will land. It will land when I know we get our produce that we're growing or from the farmer's market, right? So I wanted to be incredibly realistic about what was happening. Um, so asparagus will be in the spring, but tomatoes might be in the late summer. They might be in the fall. Corn will be in the early fall, unless, as happened last year, the deer get to it just as it ripens. Um, so all of those things, it was a very natural way of doing it. And I have to say, I, I don't want to uh, make my other book sad, but this was one of the most joyful things to write because usually what happens is that you've got a finite amount of time to write. And I had a finite amount of time to write, and I said, but I cannot write this unless I'm doing it in real time. And I wrote the book in real time. We took the pictures in real time. And so it, it is a book that was lived. And I also put another, um, I, ha I had rules. <laughs> you Go figure, me, rules. <laughs> I had a rule that there will be nothing on a page that isn't from us, that isn't from our home. So usually when you're writing a cookbook, you write the book, and then there's a week, two weeks if you're lucky, that you end up taking the pictures and then you'll get a photographer, and then you'll get somebody who brings in pr literal props, props galore. So you'll see this napkin that's just kind of in the, and then just a little serving spoon, and then it has nothing to do with the author themselves. So my rule to me was, it, first of all, it saved me a lot of money. Um, the things that are in this book that you see are literally things from my table. And the, Strangely, the caveat would be the bowl, because Andrew Pierce lent me this bowl. <laughs> but, but, so this is the cherry bowl. 
Uh, I bought myself the maple one because I like, I like maple better. <laughs> um, but other than that, they're the things that are literally at my table. Uh, and that brought me great joy. Um, and I'll, I'll give you an example. So this, at the very beginning, I think it's at the very, very beginning. Oh, this was on a piece of green Vermont marble that I've had since I first moved here. And I, it was one of those things of happenstance where I made the volavant. I had just put it there just to keep it to yell for Ray, we're taking a picture. And then I look back on it and and I saw this, and I'm like, well, I guess it's staying on my piece of marble. <laughs> it's like, and that's kind of the great thing about doing this at home with the stuff that's around you is that you can be a little more relaxed about it. Um, I can, my poor husband, I'm calling him down from work, please come down, take a picture. Um, so everything is, is from our table, and our little Ruthie's in it too. So our little Ruthie <laughs> and the pumpkins. But I did, I'm going to be honest. I just picked the nicest looking leaves and I dispersed them. <laughs> <laughs> but I did grow the pumpkins. I did grow the pumpkins. But I did, I did stage manage the leaves. I did. But they were my leaves. They were from, they were from our trees. Any other questions? Yes. That was our bakery. And it was a knock on our door every time we knocked it. And I was wondering if there's a recipe for that. Was it the Morgan bun? It was like a, um, uh, like a donut almost. Oh, yeah, the golden egg. What is it called? The golden egg. The recipe is out in the world. <laughs> it is out in the world. It's in your, it's in your memoir. It's in right? my memoir. Yeah. <laughs> this one, they've got it back at the back too. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there, there's also vanilla tea cake. Yeah. So that is also in here. So you might just have to make all the recipes to figure out which one it was. <laughs> is that bakery still there? The, I think Birch, Birch Grove is still there. Yeah. Yeah. They were our customers and they worked at Necky and then they, they bought the space. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, I will sign books. Thank you so much. Thank you.